location of traffic signals. Mm. Yeah. Because I filed a file with FOIL request and was denied. Oh, yeah. So that's a really good <laughs> observation that sometimes when we're accessing data, like one of the nice things is when the data comes in a format that we can understand. But that is like the ideal. I wish that always happened. Many times you'll get data that's incomplete, that is dirty in the sense that like there might be fields missing. So like you might have a column, for example, that says, oh, this column is tracking the make of the vehicle. But that might not have every, like that might not be filled for every single entry. So now you have to determine, how am I going to use this information even though it's incomplete? Or the data might be in an Excel file that has like 20 columns and they're all abbreviated. We'll see it later, but the good thing about the open um, data for the, state of, for the city of New York is that it does include a data dictionary, which helps you understand what do these abbreviations mean? What is this data describing? But ideally, it would include all the information we're interested in. So I think that's a really interesting point to highlight. Like, yeah, I have the traffic data, but I don't know where the lights are. So that's like, that is a good like observation to point out in a, a gap in that data, because nothing's perfect. And all this data, anything that humans create will be biased. So same with data. The bias here could be inclusion or exclusion. You can't, you could collect all the things all the time, but then that would be an unmanageable amount of data, perhaps. So it's just things to keep in mind. Next slide, please. So we'll talk a little bit about this progression of transparency. And so really the open data movement in New York City started with um, this city record that was founded in 1873. And this began with keeping like copies, archiving copies of this newspaper. And so that was kind of the first start of the open data movement. And so again, this also helps us ask the question, what is data? And so here we have data as text, data as documents, not numbers. So it's just important to keep in mind, data takes many forms. And what we might call data, someone else might call this information. Doesn't mean that one term is right and one term is wrong. It's kind of like one of those things where if you've seen that meme with the dress, is it black and blue or gold and white? It depends on your perspective. Next slide or next part. Um, so much later, almost 100 years later, we started to have freedom of information laws. So this is where the FOIA requests would start coming in. So FOIA was more on the federal level. Freedom of Information Act. So you have that come up um, in different laws across the country, and there's also differences state by state and as well city by city. So everyone kind of, and this is very typical of like how policy and laws are passed in the US. <coughs> there is federal law, then there's state law, then there's city law, there might be county regulations. So there's more than one factor at play. Um, next, please. And so in 1993, um, before most people had access to the internet, we have the um, public data directory. And so the use of this is that it tells you all the data collected by agency. So sometimes this is really helpful. I don't know that anyone, I certainly can't, name all of New York City's agencies just off the top of my head. So the first step is knowing, like, again, you have all this data, but you need to be able to make sense of it. And so knowing, oh, okay, I can see environmental protection data. I can see juvenile justice. What's juvenile justice? Maybe I don't know what that is. Maybe that's an interesting point for me to explore. Why would we keep data on that? I might look at that data set and be horrified. Why are there so many people on this data set? Like, is this what we want to be doing? So having that nuance to understand, like, not just what is there, but why and then exploring beyond that, because the data won't answer all your questions. It's just one facet of understanding something. Um, next part, please. And then in 2012 um, is when we start really having this platform, this website based. Um, so this is the public facing side of New York City's open data platform. And here you can see like 
it's giving you options to browse by data set, and it's also giving you options to browse by the city officer agency. Has anyone heard of 311 before? Just by show of hands. Almost everyone? <coughs> so 311, um, I think, has one of the more interesting data sets. We will look at it a little bit later. But 311 is like the information hotline for the city of New York. So people can call to make all sorts of requests, complaints, ask questions. Um, it's one of the most frequently updated data sets in this platform. It's updated, I don't know if every day, but yeah, it's <laughs> updated every day. So you have a wealth of data here to understand what are New Yorkers asking about? What are New Yorkers calling 311 for? And that could be very interesting um, just to look at. Like I remember during the pandemic, I was like, I wonder like, what, like, have people's calls changed during the pandemic? If there, was there a significant change from 2019 to 2020? And aside from like questions of like, is it safe to go outside? Like what else were people asking? I haven't looked into that, but it's an interesting question. And 311 could, like that data set could potentially answer it for me. Next slide, please. Um, so now uh, we'll just do a brief overview. So we've talked uh, again about like why this came about, what it's for. Has anyone been to this website before? Does this look familiar? Okay, most of us here have seen this. And so again, this is the public facing side. And so like this interface of the website is I think pretty friendly. It's relatively straightforward. It's not too clunky. You would here use the search bar to look for a specific data set or an agency. So you could, you don't have to have the precise term. So if you just put in trees, for example, like it suggests here, it would show you all the data sets or agencies that relate to trees. So you do not need to know the name of the agency or the data set in advance. Next slide, please. And then, yep. And, and then up here, is where you can actually like, it will give you a way to browse the data that exists. So let's just say you don't have a specific thing that you want to search for, you want to browse. When you click on that data tab, you'll start coming up here. You can look at what are the newest data sets that might be really interesting. Maybe there's a new city office that came up, like Office of Technology and Innovation. I don't know how old that is. 2022. 2022 is not that long ago. So that might be really interesting to say, oh, well, what's the, what other new data sets are coming up? Or like similarly, what is missing and why is it missing? Um, and so down here, you can also view the data sets by agency or it gives you the option to view by category. And you can also look at popular data sets. So these are what people are most interested in, what people are gravitating to on this platform. Has anyone ever heard of the squirrel census? Just by show of hands. What would you say? The squirrel census. As the animal? Yes. So there's a data set um, that is on NYC Open Data, and it's a data set that tracks squirrels in New York. So you could, let's say, for example, look at Central Park and then understand what types of squirrels are here. And this, could, like, I think it's a really fun data set. I think maybe a couple years ago when I went to this conference, someone presented on the squirrel census. And they were talking about like, yeah, you know, there's like reddish squirrels, there are brownish squirrels. Where was the squirrel seen? What was it doing? And so it like, I really like looking at popular data sets and just seeing sometimes the data is just really funny. It doesn't always have to be a serious like, okay, I got to understand like all the department of like, like NYCHA's things, like I need to understand how the city works in terms of housing. That's great. Um, but it's also fun to just play around with the data and understand like, why would someone keep records about squirrels? And here we're gonna show like, if you enter a search term in a search box, so here we're searching for 311, um, we'll start to get data from this, from this entity. And so like they receive constant requests in over 100 different languages, and they have information about a massive number of government services. They're supposed to be like the one-stop shop if you have a question about 
life in New York City as it relates to the government. And so here, when we search for this data, if you use the search bar, you'll get results that look like this. And so in the first result here, we can see, okay, this looks correct. And if you don't know, it's okay. You might see 311 call center inquiry and service requests. I'm like, I don't know what's the difference between these two. So the best thing you can do, in my opinion, is come with a curious mindset. It is going to be a lot of trial and error. It might be difficult to know what to do with the data, how to understand it, how to make sense of it. But if you come with curiosity and a willingness to fail, I think it goes a lot better. Um, it can be hard to learn how to do this, but anyone is capable of doing it. And you don't have to download any software. You don't have to know any coding languages. You can do everything just on this website, on this platform. You can gain ma meaningful insights from the data without any specific prior experience. All you have to be able to do is read, understand numbers, and be comfortable enough using a computer. And so here, we've clicked on this first result, 311 service data from 2010 to present. That's a lot of data, 2010 to present. So here we have, it's telling us when the data set was updated. So when this picture was taken, it was updated January 24. It has since been updated. So when we look at it, it will not be the January 24 version. And so here you can see again, the data was provided by 311. That's the agency. And then you have all this information. This was created October 10, 2011. Right? Well, that makes sense, right? Like this data started being collected from 2010. So they could have just gone back, right? But that's a good, it's an interesting question to have. Like, oh, well, if the data is from 2010, why did they only start collecting it? Or why was the data set only created October 2011? It could be a benign, like, oh, well, it took time to compile everything and put it on the website. But it's, an, it's a good question to ask, to be critical of these things. And again, like these are just reminders, like, is the data current? So if you want to understand 311 requests in the past month, but the data set isn't updated that regularly, you'll have to wait until it is updated for you to do the analysis that you would like to do. And then the last thing here is the data dictionary that I mentioned earlier. Has anyone heard of the term data dictionary before? Okay, for those who haven't heard of it, what do you think it means just based on the word? like the term itself? There's no wrong answers. And it's also not a quiz. Definition of terms. Definition of terms. Anyone else? We'll stick with definition of terms. And so, as I mentioned earlier, sometimes these data sets here, it's telling us um, that this is all the way in the bottom here. This data has, no, it's okay. It has 35.4 million rows and 41 columns. That's a lot. And so the data dictionary breaks down what each column is talking about. So there might be one column on which borough the request originated from. And but that might be abbreviated. And the abbreviations, unfortunately, are not the same in all data sets. So the data dictionary, if you go to the next slide, it helps us just understand what are we looking at. So create date here is in a format of month, day, year, hours, minutes, seconds. So if you know that going in, you'll be a little bit less overwhelmed when you just see like a mass of numbers on the screen. Um, and here it's giving us information like this, this column is agency name, and it's telling us it's going to list it in this way. So it's a list, and they're listed like this, not in abbreviations, they're spelled out. So that's also important to know. Sometimes the city agencies are abbreviated, and then it's hard to just understand, like, what does that, what agency is that? Yep. And so just to recap, when you're looking at the data, you're asking yourself, is this what I wanted? Is the data current for what I'm interested in doing? Do you understand this data set well enough? Are there acronyms you need to look up? Or is there other information? Maybe you haven't heard of 311 before, so you might want to look up what that is first. 
And then the last thing, is the data set too large for me to use? So 41 columns and 35 million rows might be too large for the average person to mentally deal with. So that means you might want to start filtering and finding out how to make that data smaller so you can actually work with it, which is what Elif will talk about. Okay. Um, could I introduce myself? Um, my day job, I'm a researcher at NYU, Marin Institute of Urban Management. Um, and I also became an Open Data Ambassador this year. And I had learned about this program in last year's School of Data. So I'm especially excited for that um, and to be teaching this class today. Okay, so we did our search and we found the data set we're looking for. Um, Let's say we also looked at the data dictionary. We understood what it is. We know how big it is. So now we, let's say we know that we want to work with this data set. Um, do you know, so most people, like before I knew much about data, my instinct would be to go in and download it, like get it on my computer and open it in Excel. So if you try to do this with this data set, do you know how many rows Excel can open? 65,300 companies. Um, now it's a bit, is it now? so it's yeah, a bit over a million now. Okay. Um, but so there's no way you'll be able to download and open this in Excel. Huh? So what are you going to do? Thankfully, uh, this uh, platform, NYC Open Data, allows us to filter it and get the data that we, uh, we want. You go to actions. There are a few things you can do. We'll start with querying the data. That's where we'll um, filter the data. So here at the top, we get the table, and that shows us what the data looks like. The columns um, are here. Most importantly, I'd keep an eye on the rows, number of rows here, which is um, 35 million something here. Because as we filter and apply our filters, we'll see that those rows, the number will uh, get smaller and smaller. So best practice, to, because we want, so as we narrow down the data, it will get faster for the server to uh, process our filters. So the best thing to do is um, narrow it down as much as possible as a first step. And usually the best way to do is, uh, is through um, dates. Let's say you're looking at, you want to look at data service requests from a specific time frame. I, I recommend that you start from there. Um, let's say, let's look at everything from this year. So I'll go to January 2024, start with the first, and then the <coughs> second date here uh, is today's day, uh, today's time. So let's say apply, and then watch the rows here, number of rows. So it's already down to 700,000 something. Uh, let's, and then you'll also see here that the created date, the rows that were filtered, um, they're all from this time frame that we've selected. And then let's add more. Um, I'm interested in all the data from, let's say, um, all the requests made to NYPD. So I can search by agency. And if you paid attention to the um, data dictionary right now, we, we know that the agency name is the long name and then agency will be the abbreviations. So here, let's say we're looking for NYPD data. We'll do, and then apply. This didn't work. Is it case sensitive? <coughs> Um, sure. Sometimes you have to click apply twice. Yeah. So there you go. Now we're down to 278,000. We have only the NYPD um, service requests. Then, um, we. so now I'm interested in, let's say, a specific type of um, complaint. So the complaint type is more general, and then it gets more specific um, with the descriptor. and. I actually, the, what I'm looking for is, let's search for um, complaints about bike lanes, because I'm interested in finding out about obstructed bike lanes uh, in New York. 
So I'll go to descriptor and I'll say contains bike because I don't know the exact phrase. So I'll hit it twice. And it's worth pointing out that the data dictionary for a lot of the data sets will contain the possible values. So in this instance, if you're not sure what you're searching for, you can actually look in the dictionary and see like what the spike lanes are called, whether it's bicycle or bike or whatever the specific language is. Yeah, I mean, the good thing with the contains option here is like you can search whatever word you're mm -hmm. looking for, but also if you do is one of, um, like if you're looking for a number of different things, then it also That's allows you to like, it, it will show you the options. Um, so, you do bike. This is, yeah, you see like bikes, buildings, um, so these things don't come up. Bike rack repair, so you have these options. But I'll, I'll do contains again. Site curiosity is one of, um, is that similar to SQL or? Um, it could be sure. so when you do is one of it will do like it, it's not saying it has to be all of these so if you put or I think it's yeah. correct yeah. yes so it it's, it's like if you wanted to put bike and car and you want to see complaints that are about a bike or a car then that would come up and then you could use is not if you didn't want it to count something like if you are interested in bikes and cars, but let's say, I don't know if mopeds is one, but like maybe you're not interested in electric scooters. So if that was a descriptor, then you could exclude. So if you wanted to put two of them in there, bike, comma, cars, comma, moped? It, or is it bike, space, mopeds? It would be like using that down. So right now it's on contains, and contains only lets you put in like one, one entry. Right. But before when you saw like the um, bike got highlighted in blue, and we had the X next to it, so you would go through the drop down, and basically the drop down is everything that exists in that column, okay. and then you could select specific rows that you want to filter for. So it will give you a preset number of options, and then you can select several. Okay. Or like in SQL, or you could actually uh, instead of and here, you could select or, and then like you could create a bunch of new things from different columns. So. Once you filter that, maybe this is what you need. You're down to 5,500 draws. You can export, and then, then you'll be able to download to your computer, or you can use the API endpoint, which I'll go over quickly in a bit. Um, but let's say we want to do more with the data. We can also group it here. So the group by uh, in SQL. Let's see. Let's say I want to know um, how many block bike lane requests have been made from each borough. I could group by borough, and then you could either aggregate by, you can just say count of rows here. And when I hit apply, you'll see that they're listed by borough. And then also you can sort here, let's do sort descending. I mean, this is a short, um, short list, but we see that Brooklyn has the most requests. Remember that this doesn't mean Brooklyn has the most number of bike lanes obstructed. This means like this many people put in service requests for bike lanes that they saw uh, obstructed in Brooklyn. So maybe you can do another one. Let's try zip code. We want to go into more detail. Um, and then the count of rows is actually the same as um, while I remove this, aggregating by unique key and doing the count. It's saying now, should I get rid of my results and show you a new thing? You're losing the previous result. So again, let's sort them. And this is the zip code where the most requests were put in for obstructed bike lanes. This is um, Brooklyn Heights, Dumbo area, if you're curious. So, okay, we have grouped, we filtered, we've grouped. You can also download this grouping by using the export uh, button here. Um, but we can do more cool things. So let's go back to the primer. 
Um, are there any questions so far? Okay, so we can also visualize, we can do some uh, visualiza visualizations using this platform. No, no, I just So I'll, I'll start with. Um, so again, um, to make a visualization, so since we went back to the primary and we opened the visualization uh, option, uh, it's not filtered, it's not keeping your filters, you have to redo the filtering. This time it's on the right hand side. We say we start with other filtering. Again, because this will take time, make sure to filter by date first to narrow down the number of rows you're dealing with. So here, you can either select two dates and um, see whatever is uh, the uh, service requests have been done between those dates, or if you have this option, which could be faster, relative to today, let's go back a month. Let's look at this month. Or like you can look at this year, this quarter, whichever you like. Again, the number of rows you can follow up here at the bottom. Let's add more filters. No, let's look at agency. So I'm, I'll, I'm trying to map now these bike lane obstruction uh, requests. Uh, NYPD is there already. You have to hit apply every time you add the filter. And then let's do, we know that it's the descriptor is what likely applied. Okay, let's check if it's been, yeah, it has been applied using 5,000 something rows here. So um, I want to create a map. Usually making the map, it takes the longest. So um, when you select the map option, which is this little globe icon here, it will automatically select the location column if there is one. Um, so this data set already shows the latitude and longitude of the uh, locations from which the requests were made, for which the requests were made. Uh, but it takes a while to load. So while this is doing that, I will show you some other ways of visualizing the data, and then we'll come back to this tab to see what we got. So again, let's do a filter. Um, read the date. I'll do this quarter, five. Add more filters. Agency. NYPD. Add another filter. Descriptor. <laughs> Apply. Okay, now everything else uh, other than the map, it takes a uh, much shorter time. So let's select a bar chart, but we need to select by which column we're going to um, group the data for the um, bar chart. So again, let's try what we did in the filtering and grouping step. If you do it by borrow, you see the Brooklyn. Uh, who has the most number of requests. You can go by zip. Um, now you could look at some different things, like, um, let's say, intersection street. <laughs> it's curious that Johnson Street, <laughs> this is somewhere in downtown Brooklyn, had the most requests. And then you can also see this in a pie chart. There are some customizations you can do here. Like, for example, um, you can decide on the number of slices that will be shown. So the first six uh, largest buckets uh, are shown here. And the others are grouped as in the other slice here. So there are some different things you can do and different charts. And let's go back to our map. OK, it's loaded. So we haven't customized this yet. It's just showing all the points uh, 
all the locations from which this data, uh, the, the service requests were made. And then we can style them. So like if you had the numeric value that you wanted to show uh, by the size of the points here, you would um, use this tab. And then let's color them. And this time, let's color them by the resolution description. I find this interesting. So this is how the NYPD reports closing these requests. And each, so there are a list that um, they can select options from. I, I have a quick question. Yes. So I tried to use this functionality in the data set. Yes. And I'm, so I see you got it. Uh, so it you works need to there. wait a little. You know, I, I started it and then I went back and showed you something else and came back. That's when it. Oh, loaded. it took it. it took so that it takes a while render? for the map to load. Yeah, if it's blank for a while, just you know, just wait. hang in there. Wait. <laughs> yeah, okay. and it depends on also how big your data set is. Now we're dealing with five thousand rows, so if you have more, it might have been uh, oh, a I bit see, slower. See, see. Yeah. One thing you could also do as it's loading on the bottom. Um, there's a toggle between the map and the table. Oh, so you can see the map. You can see the table loading as the map is still loading. If you go to the left, yeah. I believe, oh, okay. right where you were. Okay. Yeah, that, exactly. <laughs> sen it's sensitive. So the table oh, loads really table. quickly, and it'll just allow you to double check that like you're seeing what you're expecting. Okay. And then you can go back to the map, and you'll see it rendered. Eventually, but it does take a few minutes. I'll do a, a small sample. Yeah. Do you do you know how many like data points the map can handle? Whereas, like theoretically, it can populate I think thirty-five I've, million. I think I've plotted like the entire three hundred one data set, and eventually it will render. But okay. it just takes a very long time. Very long I, enough, yeah. it, it's the kind of thing like would you would you want to? But <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think it, it can render quite a large amount of the data there. A very long time. Like, and you can save it, yes. Okay. That's, <laughs> sometimes a lot of time is five minutes. It's a lot yep. longer. Um, and then one more cool thing you can do with the map is you can add some um, flyout labels and flyout details, meaning when you hover over these dots, it will give you more information. And you can select from uh, the columns which data you want to show. In this case, since the resolution descriptions are so long and not really easy to read from the legend, I'm going to add them to the flyout title. Um, so resolution description. I'm also interested in the dates of when they were created and like when they were closed. That will give me some idea about how long it takes for the NYPD to close these requests. Um, let's see. So that's Street, Johnson Street, somewhere here. Okay, so the police department issued the summons in response to the request. They took it the person. These white dots you'll see, they represent more than uh, one request. So when you click on them, they will uh, pop these uh, request they're representing, and then each color is a different resolution for the um, request. So, let's see. And one last thing. So we now we've also seen the visualization function. So if you want to save your uh, your charts and your maps, you have to sign in. I didn't right now, so it's telling me you're going to lose this. If you sign in, you'll, able, you'll be able to save them. And then one last thing uh, is, are there any programmers here like who works with code? OK, so this, this might be useful for you. There is also an API endpoint. Um, so when you click on it, it will give you the request URL. You can copy that and then um, I, I prepared this notebook and call up just to show you. Um, you'll probably be working with Pandas and the requests library. Um, let's run this. 
So I just copy paste my API endpoint here and then request the data. It, um, remember that this will only give you the first thousand uh, lines, it has a limit. So, and then to, to go over that, you will have to add a parameter to the uh, URL. You also filter the data through parameters. Um, but like here, I'm adding like 36 million, so that looks through everything. Um, and then you can filter by agency, so where, agency, NYPD. If, if you work with SQL, you'll be familiar with these. And there's also um, um, a description, of the, um, there's a help notebook that you can refer to. Uh, yeah, every, every data set has its own endpoint. And then if you go back to where you were, really, um, on the primer page, you can see yeah. like documentation, yes, so like little code snippets in different programming languages based on that specific data set. So based on the columns in that data set, based on the unique URL that the data set has. Yeah, okay, so you can go to this and I access this trio here, uh, the development portal. Under API documentation, actually. Under API documentation, you'll be able to. And you'll see specific documentation for this particular data set. But for folks that have not used an API before, um, this was new information to me. This is if you want to explore this data using some programming language off of this platform. So that's where you would use the API. Um, otherwise, you can always like filter and download um, a CSV file, so you have the data locally. Um, the limitation with the API is you need internet. So if you don't have an internet connection, it cannot call to get the data for you. So you don't have to do this, but if you are interested in exporting this data and working with it in a different platform, whether it's Excel, you don't need an API for that necessarily, or if you want to do it in a Google Colab, um, like Elif is, that's when you would use the endpoint, but it's not required. You could absolutely use like the map and the other visualizations in the website itself to understand the data. Yeah, and then the one last thing with the API, you can also um, construct a query like in SQL. So like this will also be in the documentation, but you could put it together like this and then add it to the end of the, um, the request URL, and then you'll be able to access the data. Yep, what was your question? Um, it's very interesting. I just want to confirm that uh, the document, uh, for example, if I do want to program using API, but I'm not sure how to filter it, as a first step, I can do manual filter uh, to get in the data set. As after I, I verify the version with eyeball the data yes. set and the field is the correct one, where I can get that URL to that, to the data any point. So basically, uh, yeah. if you go back earlier, like if you stay on the NYC open data platform, mm -hmm. when you're looking at the data on this platform, you're mm -hmm. able to filter it yourself. Right. So you can filter it in the platform itself. Right. Once you've completed that, then you'll be able to get a, like a unique link to that filtered data. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to download the whole thing and then filter it again. Right, right. Yes. I understand that. It is, my point is, I, I try to use a program to do that, but uh, I, I'm wondering if I manually do it first so that I can verify it. Then can you, can you I tell can me what you yeah, If you tilt it here and then you hit export, mm -hmm. then you can also get an API endpoint to your filtered okay. data here. Yeah. So that, that a link that copy. No, it's, it's, the, same, no? it's the same. Oh, it's the same. Yeah, it's the same. So unfortunately, oh, when sorry. you're using the API endpoint, it's only, it's only, only API. I wish. Um, that's all good. The API link that the site provides is just the entire data set. So it's you can not filter, the filter one. It's not the filter one. But if you filter it on the website or filter it in Excel and you verify like the number of rows mm -hmm. that you get, mm -hmm. you can put that same logic and parameters into the UR, into the API call and then verify that you're so getting the exact. Yeah, that part of it has to be manually. Yeah, yeah. You, unfortunately you do yeah, need to yeah. you need to add the parameters oh, okay. to the end of the API call yourself. 
Okay. Yeah. yeah thank you for Thanks. clarifying that. No problem. It's yeah. not very clear because it's confusing because if you do the download way, it does give you your filtered right. data set, but yeah. if you do it the API way, it doesn't. Yeah. And we're still working on improving that to make it clear. But yeah. I was just trying to get a sense of um, the sizes uh, that you can download, for example, is there a limit on how, you could, how big a file you can download? And, that one. and the other one is there limitations on how much you can save on their site? Um, in terms of like limitations, you can download as much of the data as you want. The problem isn't like the downloading, it's can your computer handle it? Yeah, no, I understand. Yeah, yeah. so you, you can. Like, There's you're, no limit from open data. There's a default so. limit I think that Alif was showing on the API to 1,000 rows, but you could change that. And we don't have any limits on like the amount of times you call the API or the size of the file download. Again, it's just do you want to download a multi-game file? And like, what about what you store on there? I've not run into anyone who's had a limit there. There probably is at some point, but I've not seen it. And if you wanted to just download like Excel files, like let's say you didn't want to use the API, you could theoretically go to every single data set and download the Excel, but that would only be for that point in time. So that's the limitation is like you're getting it, like let's say you downloaded it right now, tomorrow that data is not going to be automatically updated so you'd have to re-download it again but you you could theoretically do that as much as you'd like okay thank you yeah so i tried to request an api like millions of rows at once but we get a system error because we overload the service so we have to put a limitation and put some time to wait to do another request right um so this is technically, if you if your computer can handle it, then you can get as many rows back from the API as you want. But I, if, so it's Google Colab in particular. Google Colab doesn't want to load 32 million rows into Google's infrastructure, so they'll be like, eh, no, no, thank you. Um, so the way around it is either to paginate, um, which there's information in the documentation the API about this. You basically say, like, give me the first thousand rows, like, give me the next thousand rows, like, give me the next thousand rows. So that's a way to do it that kind of um, that kind of gets around that to some extent. But if you're using Google Colab and trying to get the entire 311 data set in there, it's not going to go great for you. Um, I would recommend trying to filter, like, do the filtering first in the API call before you try to load it into, um, into Colab. If you're using Python on your local machine or you've got file storage or something that's not Google's cloud storage, then you'll, you'll be fine. You can get it, it'll just take some time. Like the API call will take a long time to run. Um, but pagination is kind of a best practice anyway because it just is faster and it's easier on your machine than the computational power of trying to load 32 million rows at the same time. If you don't mind me asking, can you share a little bit about yourself? Oh, I, oh I'm yeah, just, sorry. I'm, curious. Yeah. I'm just a weirdo. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> just weird. I'm the chief analytics officer for the city. Um, and actually, in this room at 12.15, I'm leading a session about using open source APIs. And the, the this um, API is going to be one of the APIs that we talk about. So if you're interested in learning more, please stick around. Um, yeah, sorry. I, I use it. I use this a lot professionally, and also uh, no, that's why I'm weirdo yeah. in, in the back. No, thanks for telling us. Like, Absolutely. I'm like, oh wow, this person knows a lot about you. <laughs> 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 I'm like, am I just missing? Like, am I missing something? But it helps to know. That I go to like Fred and sorry, yeah. but I'm, I'm happy to get my address out. Okay. Um, yeah, just about to plug your sign. So stay here if you're interested in yeah, more about APIs. Mark will teach you a lot about APIs. <laughs> but I really appreciate you chiming in. I think that's one of the nice things about like doing these classes together is like well, no one is the expert here. So it's great like to have the feedback from everybody in the room. We're introducing this to you. So even we're making mistakes as we go along, and that's okay. Like you don't have to be an expert to use this. And it's always great to have help from your peers that can explain something you might not have tried before. Yeah. yeah. Also, the Open Data Ambassadors program, it's been mentioned that you know it's an intense training and all, but it's really fun. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, the team is great, OTI and Beta NYC. They really make the whole material fun to learn. Um, it's, it's a lovely community, so if there are any so probably not we we originally were recruiting based on like time period so like we'll recruit once a year and then we realized that we would then have way more ambassadors than we could possibly manage so we've sort of evolved to recruiting now based on how many ambassadors we have um, and we now have 21 plus another 21 who are finishing up their training um, and that's a big group for our team of 
five people, four people yeah. to, to manage. Um, but we will be recruiting at some point um, in the near future. And certainly if you sign up for the um, Beta NYC's mailing list or our mailing list, we'll definitely let you know when, when we do. And Beta has all sorts of other awesome ways to get involved with open data too. The, um, the mapping for equity work that uh, Jen talked about, and um, there's other opportunities to get involved with the program, even if it's not as, you know, becoming a full blown ambassador. Yeah, and we're hoping that more, sorry, <laughs> all of us are here because we're excited <laughs> about this program. But um, we're hoping that, um, you know, with focus on the ambassadors this summer, we can focus on more like workshop engagements for the public and each one of the ambassadors has their own unique interest in this data. So like we want them to, you know, shine a light on the topics that are interested to them and we'll uh, affect them in better uh, relation to the topics. So. But now, should we do the formal presentation of the ambassador yeah. certificates? And with, with that, um, if you want to talk to other people um, that like are the experts on this data, so the person who manages a particular data set, there is a way to get directly in touch with the city agencies that manage this information. So we have a help desk. Um, if you go to nyc.gov/askopendata, you can get there. It's also linked on the open data site.